So I took a little vacation and traveled to the other side of the country, to New York. Ah, the Big Apple. The city where more than 8 million people live. The home of Broadway, the Empire State Building, Central Park, and the Statue of Liberty. Now, Lady Liberty came to the United States from France back in 1885 in over 300 copper pieces. She came with instructions, some assembly required, batteries not included. She was a gift from the French people to the Americans. But the receiving party had to prepare the pedestal for her themselves. Hmm. Instead of New York, the statue could have ended up in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, or even San Francisco. All of these cities were willing to pay for the construction if they got the statue. But New Yorkers wanted it too. They started the fundraising campaign and managed to get all the money needed. So the statue officially called New York home in 1886, where it still resides. Sorry, Philly, I like your cheesesteaks, though. Anyway, the Statue of Liberty was my first stop, and I was very excited. But I had no idea what was to come next. Day 1. I arrived at New York City, and first thing, I took the ferry to Liberty Island. I could see her already, far away in the middle of the harbor. As the ferry approached the statue, all the people started to make pictures with her. I wasn't an exception. I asked someone to take a selfie of me, turned away from the statue, looked in the camera, and smiled. But the guy looked shocked. I asked him what was wrong, and he couldn't say anything. He just pointed to the Statue of Liberty. Well, to where it used to be. Because the statue was just gone. He said it was there, but the next second, it just disappeared. Other people saw that too and started to ask each other what happened. But no one had any idea. Still, we reached the dock and got out of the ferry. It felt like it was just some trick, but apparently it wasn't. The Statue of Liberty was really gone, and its pedestal was totally empty. Of course, there were some people who climbed up on it, pretending to be the Statue of Liberty themselves and taking photos. Very soon, authorities arrived and didn't let anyone leave the island. They said they wanted to make an investigation and catch the thief since the thief should still be there on the island. As if it's actually possible to steal the Statue of Liberty. They interrogated every single person on the island. We spent the whole day there, and in the end, they had to let us go. Who had the Statue of Liberty hidden in their pockets? <laughs> what a surprise. Day 2. That was one crazy case. So I decided to stick around in New York for a while to watch how the situation would progress. Of course, in the morning, it's all in the newspapers, magazines, and on TV talk shows. All the Times Square banners are showing the photos of the statue with headings, Have you seen me? The Statue of Liberty is gone. And even dramatic ones like, The theft of the century. The Statue of Liberty is stolen. Well, the whole Big Apple is mourning the loss. There is some crazy number of people colored in blue-green, like the patina on the statue, wearing dresses and the souvenir foam crown of Miss Liberty. By the way, all the local souvenir stores ran out of those, as well as all those little plastic statues of Liberty, too. I'm trying to avoid Instagram or any other social networks. Every celebrity and every single user post pictures of the statue with a crying emoji and a broken heart. The internet turned into one big memorial. In the evening, the Empire State Building is shining blue-green in honor of the missing statue. Day 5. New York City is even more crowded now. It seems like all of America came to the city to make sure that the statue is actually gone and it's not some internet hoax. Like we need another one of those. Now, the edge of Manhattan from where the ferry used to go to Liberty Island is overcrowded. There are many super loyal fans colored in blue-green, who honestly freak me out a bit, who are staying there all day long, waiting for the statue to somehow come back. No one is allowed to go to Liberty Island. All the best detectives of the world arrive there to investigate this case, trying to figure out what could have happened. Day 10. France officially announced that they'll make a new Statue of Liberty for New York. Well, that's super nice of them. But people keep crying, saying that no new Statue of Liberty can replace the original one, so dearly loved. Do you remember that back in 1885, 
There were other cities like Boston and Philadelphia that wanted to get the statue? Well, now they're blaming New York for losing a 151 high statue weighing 450,000 pounds, claiming it never would have happened had the statue been set in Boston or Philly, which honestly sounds absurd. Also, did you know that there's more Statues of Liberty in the world? There's a smaller version of it, which was given by the U.S. citizens to France a couple of years after the original one was set in New York. This little monument, just 37 feet high, has been standing near the Grinnell Bridge in Paris. Well, until a couple of days ago. To comfort the Americans, France transported the little copy from Paris to New York, and they put it on the pedestal instead of the one that was gone. Well, given that this one is more than 10 times smaller than the original, it looks a bit… funny. But I guess New Yorkers just can't imagine New York without one, even if it's just a replica. Also, there's a life-size copy of Lady Liberty's torch standing in Paris. Well, that one was also transported in New York and set on Liberty Island as a monument. Meanwhile, the folks in Las Vegas at the New York New York Casino and Hotel are staying awfully quiet for some reason, trying to stay under the radar about that statue ruckus. Hmm. Day 20. The world started a huge fundraising campaign to raise the money for the new Statue of Liberty. And then it ended. It took just 2 hours and 47 minutes to raise all the $100 million that was needed. Almost 2 billion people from nearly every single country in the world donated. The construction is going to start in 2 weeks in Paris, France, just like in the good old times. And then it'll be transported to the US again. Boston is still trying to insist that we shouldn't trust New York with the statue anymore. But I don't think they'll manage to persuade the world because this little replica on the pedestal still looks funny. I'll never get used to it. Also, starting today, tourists are allowed to travel to Liberty Island for the first time since the incident. It seems like all of New York wants to visit the island now, so the authorities had to go with a digital queue. All the tickets for the next two months are already booked, and it happened in less than 10 minutes. Well, given the 8 million New Yorkers and more than 250 million tourists New York City welcomes every year, I think I'll be able to visit the island about, oh, next decade. Day 31. Crazy news. Can't believe it. The Statue of Liberty, and I mean the original one, is back. They say it appeared in the middle of the night. The smaller replica is now standing next to the pedestal, and the original Lady Liberty is in its rightful place. I needed to see it, so I rushed to the harbor, just like everyone else in New York. It actually is bad. No one still knows what happened. The great minds of the world still can't solve the mystery. David Copperfield has an airtight alibi. But if you ask me, I think that the statue just left by itself. Maybe it just needed a vacation. I can picture it chilling on a beach in Central America. Can't blame it. Standing there for more than 100 years without a single day off, always being patient with all the people constantly taking pictures of you. That's not an easy job. I'm glad it took a little vacation. Maybe we won't lose it for another 15 decades. Hey, we were all worried, and she's standing there like nothing happened. Chill out, people. I'm back! If you ever fly over the deserts of southern Peru, you'll notice distinct white lines against the rusty red background. Look closer, and you'll see some clear shapes. Straight lines, rectangles, triangles, swirls. It seems like they're parts of huge drawings. You notice a monkey, a whale, a condor, a hummingbird, and whatnot. The lines were created more than 2,000 years ago by the people of the Nazca culture. Thanks to a dry climate and strong winds in the desert, most of the Nazca lines are visible today. To create them, the Nazca people removed the top layer of pebbles and revealed the soil beneath the ground. The color of the soil changes from reddish brown to yellowish gray, so the lines always look different. It looks like the creators of the lines started with small scale models and increase the proportions to create full-scale designs. Scientists have tried to decipher the meaning of the Nazca lines ever since they were first discovered in the 1920s. 
But the first mention of the lines was actually much earlier, in the 16th century Chronicle of Peru, where they were described as trail markers in the desert. Since you can't really study the lines and their symbolism from the ground, the lines became world famous only in the 1930s with the advent of commercial planes. A decade later, American professor Paul Kosak was doing his research on the lines and noticed one interesting thing. When he looked up from the line, it was pointing directly at the setting sun. It happened one day after the winter solstice, and the scientists concluded that the lines must be the largest astronomy book in the world. German scientist Maria Reicha, who got the nickname the Lady of the Lines, supported the theory that the geoglyphs served as a calendar and had some sort of astronomical purposes. She dedicated 40 years of her life to studying the lines and swept them inch by inch. She also moved into a small house close to the lines to protect them from unwanted visitors. Then in the 1970s, American researchers called the astronomy-related theory into question. They noted that in a region like Nazca, one of the driest places on Earth with only around 20 minutes of rain per year, water is a real treasure, and the straight lines and trapezoids must have had something to do with it. They could be pointing at locations for rituals that the local people organized to obtain water and make crops more fertile. The images of animals in the Andes region are also related to water. Spiders are thought to be a sign of rain. Hummingbirds stand for fertility. And monkeys living in the Amazon symbolize an abundance of water. In more recent years, the Nazca lines have become the research ground for archaeologists from Yamagata University. They're using high-resolution aerial photography and drones to discover and catalog geoglyphs. The team has identified a total of 358 geoglyphs so far, and 168 out of them in 2022 alone. They found images of humans, camelids, birds, orca whales, cats, and snakes, most likely created between 100 BCE and 300 CE. Some of the images are around 10 to 20 feet long, so it's no wonder no one was able to detect them before. The largest geoglyphs, by comparison, are 1,200 feet across, which is about the height of the Empire State Building. The researchers believe the Nazca lines were used as a form of communication in the desert. The linear ones pointed the direction from valley to valley. The ones drawn on slopes seem to have been drawn along ancient pathways between settlements. The scientists now plan to find patterns in the geoglyphs depending on their distribution. They use artificial intelligence to analyze the images. The AI generates designs that are likely to be painted in the desert, and the team then checks if they're actually among the Nazca lines. Another famous Peruvian geoglyph is a candelabra, slightly taller than the Washington Monument. You can find it on a seaside hill in the Paracas Peninsula. Researchers managed to establish the approximate age of the candelabra by analyzing the nearby artifacts. It looks like it dates back to around 200 BCE. The drawing is etched deep into the sand, and it was never mm -hmm. meant to look like a candelabra. One theory says that the drawing was supposed to resemble the trident of an Incan deity to please it. Another popular theory is that sailors used it as a beacon for navigation. Effigy Mounds National Monument on the Mississippi River has 195 known Native American mounds. Most of them are conical in shape, and there are also several that look like birds, deer, turtles, bears, and panthers. Scientists have established that the mounds date back to around 450 BCE, and the images are somewhat younger. A study of the mounds found some copper, bone, and stone tools. The builders' descendants say that the mounds served as ceremonial sites, this story is passed down from generation to generation. Some historians believe the mounds could have been also used to mark celestial events or territories. The American Southwest and the nearby regions of Mexico have over 300 intaglios, which are giant images engraved in the ground. The most famous of them are the Blythe intaglios in California, west of the Colorado River. Blythe giants are a group of six figures including that of a human being and an animal. 
Scientists believe the images are somewhere between 450 and 2,000 years old. According to the local Mojave tribe, there is an image of Mustamho, the creator of life. The animal figure shows a mountain lion who served as his helper. The largest figure is almost as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The creators of the Intaglios had to scrape the dark rock of the desert until the lighter soil showed up. It's nearly impossible to notice them from ground level. That's why they were only discovered in the 1930s, when a pilot flying over them accidentally looked down. The best way to see the giants is still from a helicopter. Kazakhstan can boast its own Nazca Lines, a cluster of around 260 earthworks in the north of the country. The steppe geoglyphs are a variety of geometric shapes, including squares, crosses, circles, and a three-pronged design. The creators of the images used materials such as dirt, rocks, and lumber to build them out of the ground. A local economist first spotted the geoglyphs while browsing Google Earth in 2007. Archaeologists suppose that the structures go back 8,000 years, but they still don't know who built them or why. One theory says that the lines helped track the sun's movement. NASA got interested in the discovery since the lines are much older than the ones in Peru. They took photos of the steppe geoglyphs from space, trying to solve their mystery. Another fact that makes the lines so special is how huge they are. One of the largest of them has sides as long as an aircraft carrier. The only humans who could have built them must have been the nomadic Stone Age tribes. But it's unlikely that they had such advanced tools. If they did, that would mean that archaeologists need to rethink the abilities of our long-ago ancestors. Organizing such a huge amount of people to work together on a complicated project is an amazing feat. Although the white horse on a lush green hill in Oxfordshire, England could easily pass for modern art, it's actually one of the most ancient geoglyphs. It was created between the Bronze and Iron Ages and is the oldest chalk-cut hill figure in Britain. Whoever created it had to remove the turf to reveal the chalky white part of the soil. Scientists can only guess why this piece of art was created. It could have been a fertility symbol or a way to mark territory. Aerial images prove that the horse has changed over time because of the soil. It took several centuries to reveal a larger horse-like shape that lies under what we see now. The shores of Lake Superior in Michigan are home to glowing euperlite rocks, a natural phenomenon of cyanite rocks rich with fluorescent soda light minerals. These rocks glow under ultraviolet light, providing beautiful patterns inside and out. When they first found the rocks, they couldn't identify them as any existing type of rock. Although they've been mainly obtained from Lake Superior, their origin story takes them back millions of years. They formed from thick continental crustal areas of Canada. They then slowly followed the continental ice sheets along with the glaciers some thousands of years ago. Natural phenomena occur in many forms, and the only thing humankind has to do is admire their intrigue and beauty. Seeking the end of a rainbow has long been an opportunity to find a pot of hidden gold. This is an old tale that originates back to the time when Vikings buried their gold in Ireland. Philosophers and scholars had an understanding of how rainbows rationally formed even before then. Rainbows are an optical illusion, the result of refraction and reflection. This combo happens thanks to the spreading of white light through the water droplets at multiple angles, dispersing the white light into a continuous distribution of colors. Every rainbow you ever witness is a double one, though the second band isn't always visible, as more white light escapes being spread further apart. The light escapes upwards, as opposed to the primary bow, which is downwards. Some cultures believe the northern lights were created by a great fire fox running across the skies. Others, that it was created by the plumes of great whales. Many northern cultures were sure it's a sign positive news was on the way. How it occurs is still intriguing, just in a more scientific way rather than mythical. Great solar storms caused by the sun 93 million miles away send waves of charged solar particles into space in all directions. When the Earth crosses paths with one of these waves, the magnetic field and the atmosphere respond. 
As the charged particles from the sun strike atoms within Earth's atmosphere, electrons move to a higher energy state. Then, as they drop back to a lower energy form, they release light photons, creating the auroras on the north and south poles. Volcanoes are an exciting display of Mother Nature. They're formed when hot molten rock, ash, and gases escape from an opening on the Earth's surface. The molten rock and ash solidify as they cool, creating the volcano spout as it erupts further, pushing more ash into the sky. The naturally occurring phenomena from a volcano with the combination of lightning is a different spectacle altogether. When a volcano emits dense ash clouds close to the ground, it causes particles to rub together, creating static electricity, which results in lightning strikes above the volcano. As the ash clouds rise higher towards the stratosphere, jostling ice particles can create great bolts of lightning. This combination is similar to how a thundercloud produces lightning. Thunderstorms normally form in the late afternoon, when the sun has heated the earth and atmosphere enough for the right environment. Warm, moist air rises into the cold air, causing condensation and sending cooled air drops of water into the atmosphere, where it warms and rises again. A supercell thunderstorm is likely to further transform into a tornado. It happens as the warm air rises through the colder air, causing an updraft, and rotates with fast winds blowing in different directions. As more warm air is drawn and the rotation increases, cool air in the jet stream with strong winds in the atmosphere provides further energy to feed on. The moist air forms a funnel cloud that grows, descending to the ground and spawning a tornado. The USA has the most tornadoes in the world, around 1,200 per year. They're also some of the most destructive and far greater in size than anywhere else. They're especially bad in the so-called Tornado Alley, with mid-level dry air coming from the Rockies, along with cold air approaching from the northern half of the continent. The fallen civilization of Atlantis has been a popular myth romanced by science fiction and other beliefs. Many locations have been theorized for its true location. One of its many supposed whereabouts has been the Blue Eye of the Sahara, or the Reshot structure. Although it's an interesting notion, this geological formation had built up over the course of millions of years. Volcanic activity initially lifted the entire landscape from around the eye and, over time, eroded and collapsed upon itself. Eventually, it formed onion-like layers of rock and the great eye that can be seen while flying above. Apart from being a marvelous sight, there isn't anything solid to claim Atlanteans actually resided there. There are several locations around the world with pink lakes. This unique color is a product of the right amount of sunlight and heat in a body of water with large salt content. Only specific microbes can withstand such extreme conditions. They produce and collect carotenoids. The carotenoids are a class of plant chemicals found in cells of vegetation to help absorb sunlight. As the microbes help create the pink algae, brine shrimp feeding on the algae also turn pink, as do flamingos' feathers as they feed on the shrimp and algae. For decades, the mystery of sailing stones in the desert has had people stumped. Some rocks as heavy as a human would somehow move across the sand, leaving a long trail behind them. Yet, when observed, the rocks were completely motionless. It wasn't until advanced technology used to monitor their movements found that this wasn't some elaborate prank, and the stones didn't have a mind of their own. They found during winter that melting ice panels would allow the stones to move in all directions with the assistance of light winds. The rocks can travel up to 16 feet per minute. The Christmas Island Crab is part of an amazing phenomenon once a year. Their migration period is determined by the phase of the moon and the first rainfall between October and February, although the precise date can't be predicted. Once the crabs have been prompted, they leave their homes amongst the forest and migrate in massive hordes towards the sea. Numbering in millions, a sea of red crabs is observed as they make their journey across the island, creating roadblocks and making their way to the ocean. There, they lay their eggs and then make their trek back returning to the forest until the next year. Crop circles are a popular hoax on land, but underwater, they occur naturally, without the intent to try and trick people. 
male pufferfish spend seven to nine continuous days laboriously making intricate patterns in fine sands, hoping for a female to approach and inspect their artwork. Unfortunately, the complicated patterns aren't maintained once the purpose is fulfilled. They soon fade away after being made, making their discoveries by humans rare. One could imagine the first diver's reaction as they came across these weird patterns. Deserts aren't the most likely of places for flowers to grow, but they share a similar rose that grows in each of them all around the world. The desert rose doesn't grow biologically, but is formed from crystal clusters made from gypsum or barite. These crystals form a circular series of flat plates that give the rock a similar shape to a rose petal. The texture and sizes can vary depending on which desert they're from and the type of sands that are in the surrounding environment. Bioluminescence, which is the production and emission of light by a living organism, is a phenomenon that many species on Earth share. Algae create an ethereal glow in the ocean during the night. These tiny marine organisms glow with the smooth movements of the waves, commonly noticed on the shores of beaches. The light is activated from movement. In massive groups, they appear like stars, twinkling in their millions. Animals that have the ability of illumination use it in different ways within their unique environments. Jellyfish floating ominously in the depths emit a glow as a warning towards would-be predators. Tiny bacteria, only visible under a microscope, use their light as a form of communication. Deep sea fish, like the anglerfish, use a light at the end of their head as bait to mimic smaller fish and lure them towards them. Fireflies glow at night to attract potential mates, and click beetles emit an orange light upon being disturbed, using it as a defense mechanism. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.